It's called, isn't it called, the, I think it's called the Wild Duck Cluster or something like that. I'll it's look it up. Yeah, look that one up. <laughs> All right. I think it is. Anyway, it's, a, it's an open cluster. It's just a cluster of stars. It's, it's a nice cluster for a couple of reasons. Firstly, so it's the, remember there are the two types of, of star clusters, the globular clusters, which are all old and sort of round looking and the spherical halo around the Milky Way and have lots and lots of stars in them. And then there are these things called open clusters, which typically live in the plane of the Milky Way. They have a much wider range of ages. They tend to be less luminous, so there's less stars in them, and they tend to be kind of rattier in appearance, not as pretty as the, as the globular clusters. Yeah. And this is one of the, that second class. It's an open cluster. As open clusters go, it's quite interesting because actually it's got quite a lot of stars. So there's a lot of stars in there, and it's fairly young. It's not. It's sort of intermediate age. It's not ridiculously young. The trouble with the ridiculously young things is they tend to be have lots of dust and things still in them, so actually you can't actually see what's going on very clearly. Um, and very old ones, all the young interesting stars will have gone through their lifetime all the things that have short lifetimes will have gone through them and so they will have just died off so this is somewhere in between it's still got some reasonably massive stars in it um, but it's got a lot of stars and actually we can see what's going on in it and what's going on in it so well here's a picture of it this is actually taken from so there you go this is the usual thing that astronomers like doing is printed as a negative so all the little black dots you can see in here are stars and this is a study that was done of this uh, open cluster about, when was it done? 2007, this particular study was published with a relatively small telescope. Um, they were just basically imaging this cluster. And what they did is they took a series of images over a series of nights and looked for variable stars. So they looked for stars that change with time. Um, and th that, you know, you learn a lot about the structure of stars just by looking for the, the oddities. And in this case, the oddities are the ones that don't look the same every night. What can make a star vary from night to night? So there's a whole bunch of different mechanisms that can do it. The most mundane that you can think of is if that star was actually two stars very close together and you couldn't actually see that there were two stars, um, then if they're in orbit around one another, especially if they're in an eclipsing system, so if they go, one goes behind the other, as time goes on, you're going to see those eclipses. You're going to see one star passing in front of the other, then behind it. And so that actually is a very characteristic sort of signature that you end up seeing. And that would change night to night? So yeah, if they're on a close system, so they're actually orbiting around one another, if you're monitoring it for a few weeks, you can actually see them orbiting around and start picking out these eclipses as they pass around in front and behind each other. I mean, there are different categories of these things. You know, if you keep pushing the stars closer and closer together, you end up with things called contact binaries in the end, where really the two stars are really are kind of touching each other. And there you get a whole, a whole nother kind of, kind of variability can be going on, because these things really are, as they, are, you know, as they uh, orbit around, and you're seeing this system from different geometries, different directions, um, then you really will see quite a lot of variability. But even if they're, you know, sort of significant distances apart so that they really are just a couple of stars then, um, the timescales can be quite short. But that wasn't the one I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about a kind of star called a Delta Scuti star. And a Delta Scuti star is another kind of star uh, which varies over time in a fairly characteristic sort of way. Scuti? Scuti. So it's from the constellation Scutum, the shield. Um, so the, 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 the archetype, the first one that was seen of this, was, is the, the, the fourth brightest star in this constellation, so it's Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, so it's Delta Scuti is the, is the kind of archetype, and they're all called Delta Scuti stars after that. Even, oh, so they find them all over the place. Yeah, exactly. So it's a particular kind of star. That was the first one that was found, and it's kind of the archetype, but then you sort of find the same phenomenon going on all over the place. The kind of plot that people who study stars like to make is this one. We've seen it quite a few times before. Yeah. It's one of these things called a colour magnitude diagram, where you've got how bright the star is up here from faint things to bright things, and what colour it is along here from blue things to red things. And remember, blue things are sort of hot and red things are cool. So this is a, a measure of temperature increasing this way, and this is brightness increasing this way. So this is the colour magnitude diagram that these guys put together from observing this particular cluster, um, and they also picked out the things which were varying. And the ones I wanted to, to talk about are these ones that have got little star symbols here, and these are the Delta Scuti stars. So these are these particular stars that vary in, this, vary in this particular way, and you can see they're not spread all over the place. They are actually really strongly concentrated in this region of the diagram. They don't seem to be quite on the main highway there, though. They're kind of sort of on the main highway or just turning off. So this is the main sequence. This is where most stars like the Sun live. These are the stars which are turning hydrogen into helium in their cores. And these are stars which are either on the main sequence or just a little bit off it. The, the, the obvious question is why are they varying? Why, you know, what, what is it that's making them vary? Um, because they are single stars. It's not like you've got stars in orbit around one another. These are single stars which are varying with time. And the picture of what's going on is these are stars which are pulsating. So they're stars which are not just sitting there minding their own business. They're actually shrinking and, and growing and shrinking with time. 
And in fact, this particular class of stars don't even do it. So the simplest way that something can, can shrink and, and grow and shrink is sort of radially. It just gets bigger in all directions at the same time. These things actually have, tend to have rather more complicated oscillations. So they can be changing shape as they're, as they're growing and shrinking. So they're rather strange stars from that point of view. And there's a, the, the mechanism by which stars do that is quite interesting and quite well understood. It's a thing called the Kappa mechanism. Now, kappa is a symbol that's used for the opacity of a star, how, how opaque it is, how hard it is for light to get out. If something's opaque, then obviously, you know, then, then light doesn't get through. If it's transparent, then light does. So opacity is just a measure of, of how transparent a star is. And opacity has this property that usually what happens is that when you make something hotter, it becomes more transparent. And that, in some sense, acts like a sort of natural safety valve. Because if you imagine you've got a bit of a star which, you know, it starts to get overheated, then it produces more light and gets hotter, but that light all escapes, the energy escapes, and then the thing can cool back down again. So it sort of acts in, in the sort of safety valve kind of way that if things start going bad, it just corrects itself. Under what circumstance could a star's light not escape? Well, star, so starlight doesn't just escape instantaneously from a star, right? When, a, when the light's produced in the center of a star, it takes thousands of years to bounce its way out through the star and finally escapes from the surface. So it's not, you shouldn't think of stars as just having the light sort of streaming freely out of them. The light that's produced within the star takes a long time to work it, make its way to the surface. So actually the opacity of the star is, is the thing that sort of dictates that. It's related to its density, how dense the material is. Obviously the more gas you've got there, the harder it is for the light. You know, the light bounces around more, so it takes longer to get out. It also depends what the star's made of, because you know, different materials have different types of opacity. As I say, generally speaking, in most circumstances, as it also depends on the temperature of it, and usually as the temperature goes up, things escape more easily. However, there are circumstances in which when the thing gets hotter, it actually gets more opaque. And that typically happens when a particular element is being ionized. So if the temperature gets to just the point where helium, for example, is having its electrons ripped off, as you go through that phase, that temperature phase, you find that, that as the temperature increases, the opacity actually increases rather than decreasing. And that potentially has this rather catastrophic effect, because if you think about some region of the star, um, starts getting hotter and producing more radiation. If you get into that, this phase where, where the opacity is actually going up, that's like putting a bigger blanket around the thing that holds the heat in. It stops the light escaping, which is going to make it even hotter there, which then makes it more opaque, which means that it gets you know, even more better held in. And so you can have this kind of runaway process. So it's like, it's like if you were too hot in the night pulling extra blankets on rather than taking the blankets off. Right? And so actually you, you just get these weird runaway effects. Eventually the radiation pressure and the gas pressure underneath builds up to a point where actually it makes the entire star, outer layers of the star expand. So rather than the, 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 the heat escaping just by the light getting through this layer of the star, it eventually reaches a point where the heat can't escape, it just makes the whole outer layer of the star expand. At that point, things cool back down again. When it cools back down again, the opacity decreases again, which means the light can get out again, the heat can get out again, so it shrinks back down again. So there's this, this process of, of oscillations can start to occur where the opacity is, is in this weird state where increasing the temperature actually makes the opacity go up rather than going down. And that's this process called the Kappa mechanism. There are only certain types of star which, where that, those conditions are actually met, where the, the, the conditions are met in the right part of the star for these oscillations to occur. If it's too far out in the star, then basically, well, the outer layers of the star will just expand and go off into space. If it's too deep in the star, then other processes kick in, convection, and actually the weight of the star will hold it all down, and so it'll never happen. It's only when the, the, this weird process occurs at just the right part of the star that you end up having these oscillations. And if you plot where those things happen in a diagram like this, there's this big swathe across this color magnitude diagram where these oscillations occur. Okay, so basically any star that lies in a region like this will undergo these kind of oscillations and, and will end up pulsating. And so there's various different classes of star that live in this swathe, but the reason why this particular cluster is sort of interesting is because it actually has a, a main sequence that cuts through where that swathe occurs. Okay, so there are, there are lots of stars in this region here. If you went to an older cluster, then there wouldn't be any of these massive bright stars left. They'd all have died long ago. And so, so it's only because we're looking at a relatively young cluster that the main sequence stretches through this region where this instability occurs. And where these two intersect, where the main sequence is and where this instability occurs, that's where these delta squitty stars are. And that's why this particular cluster has a lot of them, is because it has a long enough main sequence, it's a young enough cluster, that we end up with a whole bunch of these delta squitty stars.